Well, there are a lot of things going on in Russia that give the Russians reason for self-satisfaction and even a certain cockiness. The economy is strong. The leadership structure seems to be very stable. There's not a lot of turmoil of the kind that there was in the 90s. There's not a lot of the hardship that there was in the 90s. But uh, the darker side of the equation is that Russia is much less free, much less democratic, much less uh, free press, much less of an open society, and much more inclined to throw its weight around in the world, and particularly in its own neighborhood. And over time, I don't think that kind of Russia is going to qualify as a truly modern, normal country of the kind that we all want to see Russia become. One of the principal things that President Putin did uh, back in 2003 was he defederalized a very large country which calls itself a federation. The formal name of Russia is the Russian Federation. And federation, of course, is a system and philosophy of government that, bases, uh, that is based on sharing and devolving to and delegating to regions of the country and communities within the country as a whole uh, a great deal of responsibility for governing themselves. Uh, the United States is a federation. Uh, Russia is by name a federation, and President Putin made it much less of a federation. And one of the things he did, for example, was to put all of the governors of the various parts of Russia directly under the control of the Kremlin, so that the Kremlin was in effect running this entire vast country. Uh, now, the, one of the problems with that is that it means that the central government in Moscow, and particularly when the power in Moscow is concentrated very much in the hands of one man, cannot be anywhere near as responsive uh, to the special needs of uh, the different parts, the geographical parts of the country, and also to the many different nationality groups that make up Russia. They're brave good people who are giving it their best shot and who are almost completely marginalized in terms of their ability to have any real influence either on the outcome of the election or the way in which the country is governed. And I think by and large they recognize that, but to their great credit they don't give up and often displaying uh, very real physical as well as political courage uh, try to uphold at least the principle of a loyal opposition. The U.S.-Russian relationship since President Bush came into office in 2001 uh, has had its ups and downs, but the downs have not been all that far down. There have been moments of tension, mo moments of mutual uh, annoyance and, and disillusionment, but there haven't been any crises of the kind that we had during the Cold War, and we will not uh, see those. I think we're in for a fairly long period where Russia is going to be feeling its oats. It's going to be taking full advantage of the extraordinary wealth that it has as a result of high oil prices and the amount of natural resources that it has, uh, and will be uh, refusing to go along with the United States on a lot of foreign policy issues in the way that it went along with the United States back in the 1990s. But it's going to be more in the category of another great power, not a superpower, not a global superpower, but a very significant power, uh, that the United States can do some things with uh, and will have to manage its disagreements with that country on a lot of other issues. Among the issues that are certainly on the agenda for the remainder of the Bush administration, the question of missile defense uh, looms fairly large. Um, I uh, think that it was a mistake of the Bush administration to uh, force the issue of deploying uh, missile defense facilities in, in Central Europe on the territory of uh, former Soviet allies, which are now, of course, uh, American allies. Uh, it was uh, strategically un unnecessary and gratuitous and provocative, and it's just, and it's, by the way, caused a certain amount of uh, difficulty between the United States and our European friends, not to mention with the Russians. And I think that depending on the outcome of the American elections, that issue might be tamped down. There are other issues that are uh, are going to remain contentious, uh, particularly Russia's apparent determination to reassert control, uh, or at least a very high degree of influence over uh, independent countries in its own neighborhood that used to be republics of the USSR.
Well, Russia's relations with Europe have always been tinged with uh, a degree of ambivalence on both sides. Uh, in a very real sense, uh, Russia is part of Europe. Uh, Russian literature, music, culture, art uh, have greatly enriched what we think of as European uh, civilization. But partly because Russia did not go through, at least in anything like the same sense as Western Europe, uh, the Enlightenment, or for that matter, uh, the Industrial Revolution, and also because Russia is a bicontinental uh, power. It's, it's in, it's as, uh, more of Russia is in Asia uh, than is in, in Europe. Uh, it is. It has always felt itself to be and been perceived by Europe as being kind of on the edge of Europe, but not really part of Europe. Uh, and that's been true for hundreds of years, and it's uh, it's also been true in more recent years. I don't think uh, many Russians have much hope, uh, or in perhaps some cases even much desire to be part of the European Union uh, someday. But uh, it's a little bit uh, like a version of that old Groucho Marx line. They're uh, quite suspicious of any club that they can't be in, uh, and they doubt that they will ever be actually in the European Union. They want to have a partnership with the European Union, but there's always going to be a competitive and perhaps in, on some areas like oil and gas an exploitative uh, dimension to that relationship. Uh, and I think the Europeans uh, recognize that, and while they are prone to being pushed around a bit by uh, Russia now that it's a so-called energy superpower, the Europeans are focusing on Russia and the challenge it represents in a very positive way. The biggest challenge I think the European Union has is to restore its own sense of uh, pride in what it has accomplished over the past 50 years and to pay at least as much attention to the positives uh, of the European Union as to the challenges and the disappointments and the frustrations that accompany this extraordinary experiment that's going on. I mean, the bottom line, what the Europeans have been able to accomplish uh, under the flag of the European Union and before that the uh, European community and before that the steel and coal community and so forth and so on is unprecedented in history. They took a huge uh, blood-soaked piece of the globe's real estate, uh, a part of the world that had suffered endemically from the worst kind of wars, a part of the world that had produced uh, both of the world wars of the 20th century, the Cold War, uh, numerous cases of genocide, and a holocaust. That's a pretty lousy record uh, for a, a region of the world. And starting after World War II, and in the midst of the Cold War, the Europeans were able to, in, to turn that entire region into a zone of peace. And while they, can, they have lots of disagreements among them, and uh, there is disillusionment with the European Constitution, uh, particularly in countries like France and Holland and so forth and so on, the fact remains the European Union is the single most successful and promising experiment in supranational uh, governance, that is, having multiple nations be able to preserve their own identity, but uh, moving up to a level above nations, uh, certain decisions and policies that can best be handled at that level, and at the same time protecting the prerogatives of the member states and of communities within those member states. And in accomplishing that, they've not only brought peace uh, to a region that had seen nonstop war for all of those centuries, but they've also created a model for other parts of the world to study and, I hope, emulate. I, I would hope that this new crop of leaders that we see emerging, they're not so much a new generation, they're new faces, and many of them are the same generation of the people that they've replaced, uh, Gordon Brown being, of course, the example of that. But um, I think that we'll see a new degree of energy and some fresh thinking. Uh, and I hope uh, a reaffirmation of commitment uh, both to the European project, making the most of the European Union, and also to the uh, central importance of the transatlantic relationship. There is no contradiction whatsoever, or at least there shouldn't be any contradiction, between having a strong and increasingly stronger uh, European Union and having strong ties uh, to the United States. Uh, because our values are the same, our security in interests uh, ought to be basically the same, 
And uh, there's every reason that uh, th we can have a strengthening of the transatlantic bond while at the same time having the European Union get a new lease on its own life. There are two in particular that I think represent uh, not just challenges but existential threats to the planet. One is the issue of proliferation and the other is the issue of climate change. And uh, given the uh, fact that uh, so many of the world's uh, nuclear weapons are under the control of either uh, West European countries, uh, by which of course I mean uh, Britain and, and France, uh, and also uh, the United States, three of the non-proliferation tre uh, treaties uh, acknowledged or approved nuclear weapon states, which are five in number, three of those are in uh, the community that we're talking about here. So uh, the U.S., uh, France, uh, Britain uh, have a particular responsibility to take the lead on doing something about the problem of proliferation and the erosion of the non-proliferation treaty. And second, as so much of the greenhouse gases uh, produced uh, on the planet uh, are, are coming from the United States plus the EU, Obviously, there are lots of other issues as well, but if the United States and the EU can get their own acts uh, synchronized and together in some fashion, that'll augur very well for the world's ability to deal with those problems.